Hello, everyone. I'm Jess Bazo of Performative, an Argyle company, the leading online resource for the office of the CFO. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, Future Proofing Accounts Payable. I'd like to thank today's sponsors, Oracle NetSuite and Topalti. Their commitment to thought leadership helps us make today's webinar possible and delivered at no cost to today's participants. Before I turn things over to today's featured speakers, we have just a few housekeeping items to cover. First, the slides are available as a PDF under the resource list. We will send you links via email to the presentation and the recording within 24 hours. For those attendees who are seeking CPE credit today, you must answer all polling questions and of course remain on the line for the duration of today's webinar. Afterwards, if you are eligible to receive credit, you'll be able to click on an icon to download the certificate located in the certification section. Any questions, you can email cpe at performative.com. We encourage you to submit topical questions throughout today's webinar. Uh, we've set aside some time to address your questions following today's session, so please do submit those questions uh, under the Q&A section of the interface. And finally, please take the short survey at the end of today's webinar. Now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce today's featured speakers on the line today. We're excited to have Ann Wheeler, who is a consultant with CS Process Flows and is a project manager and consultant specializing in accounts payable. CS Process Flows specializes in identifying ways for accounts payable operations to become more efficient and assisting companies in reaching their goals from refining policies and procedures to managing AP automation projects. We're also joined by Rob Israt, who is a CMO at Topalti. Rob brings over 15 years of experience at Topalti and most recently served as the VP for Global Marketing Programs at NetSuite, a global provider of cloud-based financials and enterprise resource planning software. We'll start things off with insights from Anne and then transition to Rob's section later on today. Anne, it's now my pleasure to turn things over to you. Welcome. Thank you, Jeff, and hello, everyone, whether it's good morning or good afternoon. This is, again, a presentation on future-proofing accounts payable, and there's so much about technology today that can really help with the heavy lifting. So there's a lot to cover. Let's get started. So the agenda today is that we will be introducing or talking about the Vendor Master. Believe it or not, this is a per an important component of any automation of accounts payable. We will also be talking about anti-money laundering and how you really should be vetting your vendors before you add them into your system. We'll be talking about the vendor master and again, AP invoice automation. We'll also talk about tax and other compliance rules as it relates not just to the vendor master, but to automation the auto routing and validation of invoices, levering automation in a fast growing business, or even when we have issues such as this pandemic. And we'll talk about applying technologies to payment. So first of all, what is a vendor master? It's a collection of vendor records that's usually stored in the company's AP and or ERP system. Invoices or payments generally cannot be processed without a vendor record. Even if you have what we call a one-time vendor, there would still need to be pertinent information supplied in the system in order to track or find any payments that are made to that particular vendor. So we talked about the vendor master being made up of vendor records. What's a vendor record? It's the vendor's details that are that you should have when creating um, a vendor record and for processing invoices and payments. You want to be able to track these vendors um, for 1099 purposes or should uh, there be an issue with any sort of orders. The vendor record, at the very least, should contain the full legal business name. This is usually what is supplied to you on a 1099, all right? Keep in mind that you may also have DBA or doing business as names that should be included. The registered addresses, and you'll notice that's a plural, because there could be the fiscal address of the vendor, a remit to address of the vendor, and possibly a different address for placing purchase orders or performing other tasks with that vendor. Of course, you should always record the tax ID number 
even if you're not issuing 1099. All right. Keep a record of their tax status. Are they an individual, an LLC, a corporation? Payment terms. You know, this is talking about how many days before the vendor expects to be paid. It could be 30 days, a discount, could be the 15th of the next month. But it's important to save this information because you don't want to um, pay invoices early one month and then expect it to be okay to pay them like the next month according to the vendor. And of course, there's the payment method. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail here. If you are creating or adding a new vendor, Consider what's required. Definitely, you need the IRS forms. That would be the W-9 or the W-8 if it's an overseas vendor. Contractual terms. Again, this is where payment terms come into play, the payment methods, whether there is anything else that accounts payable or anyone dealing with that vendor might need to know about. Again, correct contractual terms aren't just on their side, but also on your side. Uh, anything to do with is the freight not to be paid or, um, you know, anything that the purchasing group has agreed to. And of course, banking details if you're paying by ACH or by wire. And again, we're going to talk about the anti-money laundering. A compliant indicator should also be in your vendor records, especially in the event of audit. If you're doing government contracts, you may be audited by the government to make sure that you have vetted against the um, systems that we'll be mentioning for anti-laundering. Okay. So the main reason why you want to vet vendors is to assess their behavior. Are they working with other governments or other vendors or companies that really are not in the best interest of the U.S. and our laws. There is an organization called the Office of Foreign Asset Control that has a list of sanctioned parties. And this is a great tool to be able to match up your vendor information that you've gotten from them to make sure that everything's on the up and up. Again, agreement to U.S. foreign policies, national security. These are things that if you go to this website that's listed here, you will learn more information about what to look out for. But the thing is, is that just like with a lot of other components of doing business, you as a representative of the company or the company itself want to make sure that you're not doing any sort of business with companies or agencies that might cause an issue with foreign policies or national security. When you create a new vendor record, include the required data and indicators as we just talked about. Again, full business at name, addresses, payment terms, and the compliant indicator. When you're editing a vendor, make changes as requested by the vendor, making sure that it's on official letterhead or that you're getting a phone call or an email and that you're confirming that it is the vendor, the company, that's requesting those changes. It's not somebody just calling to make changes for information or funds to be put to their bank account. You want to be able to confirm that it is the vendor itself that's requesting these changes. You may also want someone within your company, whether it's someone from purchasing or accounts payable or compliance, to review the information and approve it. Okay. Reasons for editing a vendor might include changes to an address, changes to a payment method, bank details. However, if there is a change in name, tax ID number, or the bank details are changing and they may be like a totally different bank or different account name on, uh, on the bank account, you may want to consider creating a new vendor. For that, you would want new forms, meaning the IRS forms. Again, you might want to review of the contractual terms to make sure nothing has changed. And this might happen if 
the vendor is being acquired by an, um, another company or is being taken over by a new owner. If this should, should occur, you also want to do the anti-money laundering check, again, to make sure there's um, compliance. Okay. Again, if you have a new name, tax ID, treat as a new vendor. Give them a new number. Now, that being said, you would also want to make sure that you, as soon as you can, deactivate the original vendor number. Consistency in applying procedures. Hopefully, your company has the procedures on setting up new vendors so that from vendor to vendor, the information is being collected the same way, it's being entered the same way, it can be searched upon the same way. Which forms do you, your company, need? Is it just a W-9? Is it just a W-8? Or are there other forms, especially, again, if you're doing government work, you may need to request additional information or forms. Make sure that they're completed correctly and that they're signed by a representative, an authorized representative of the vendor. Okay. All of this reduces financial risk. You want to be able to make sure you have one record per vendor, ideally one record per tax ID number. Now, yes, there are some very large companies out there that have multiple locations across the country, but they may only have one remit to address, or if for your company, they may only have one. They may have others, but again, you in your company may want to work with that vendor to make sure that you have one remit to address, therefore you have one um, vendor code for that particular vendor. And of course, you want to make sure that you have the correct tax ID number, addresses, and, and bank details. Make sure you have checks and balances for accuracy. So if you get a request, for example, for a new vendor, or you think it's a new vendor, you may want to search in your system, not just for the vendor name, because again, if they may have changed their name or it may not be consistently presented the same way, check the, to the tax ID number. Search for the tax ID number to see if it's possible. It's already been set up in your system, and if so, confirm the company name, the name for the vendors, <clears throat> to make sure that there isn't some sort of duplication or there may be some inaccuracy within your system. Another issue that doesn't sound like it's a big deal, but it can cause issues, especially if your ERP system or accounting system reads upper and lower case letters differently. So for example, if you are pulling a list of all vendors and then you're sorting them in alphabetical order, believe it or not, uppercase letters may show in a different section than any vendors that were set up with lowercase, okay? So again, be consistent. The same with punctua punctuation. If you use the period after AV, right, short for avenue, or you include commas or hyphens, that type of thing, nothing wrong with that, but make sure you're consistent in doing that from vendor to vendor. Access to your vendor information. Consider segregation of duties. For example, the person who is managing your vendor master should not have access to be able to process invoices and or process payments unless the segregation of potential duties or it's been reviewed by your, your own compliance team and they agree that it might be acceptable for the person to manage vendor master and also be able to do the payment process since they wouldn't be able to actually create an invoice. So that is something that is internal to your company, but again, consider the segregation of duties, the size of your company, and the risk that your company may want to bear. You may also want to limit access to the vendor master to only the vendor master team. Now again, if you have a small company and you don't have dedicated personnel to manage your vendor master team, 
then again, identify those people and limit whether it's a person from purchasing and a person from accounts payable. In other words, don't open your vendor master to multiple people in purchasing AP or other uh, groups because, again, you don't want them going in there and uh, making changes. Store your records, hopefully within a vendor master system. All right. If you need to take paper documents and you're filing them, make sure that those filing cabinets or the room that they're stored in is secure. And um, again, limit the access because again, you have tax ID numbers in there. You may have bank information in there. Ideally, a secured network drive works. Okay, we've already talked about limiting the access. So vendor master management options. Think about the challenges we just talked about. There's the in potential inconsistency of collecting data because someone forgot to check off a box to say they got the uh, W-9 or some other pertinent information. So if you had a system, a vendor master system, um, that allowed for the checks and balances or checked for them, that would be a plus. There's also been situations in my own personal career where the vendor master system that we had access to was not sufficient. As things changed, as government requirements changed, there was no place to put certain indicators, or there may not have been uh, places to put codes such as um, minority vendors, um, the different classifications, that type of thing. Okay. The other thing to consider is that your knowledge base of the people that have access to the system, whether it be IT, accounts payable, purchasing, or again, the person that is, or people that are entering the data. All right. Make sure that your vendor master team, that the vendor master system, that everyone involved in this process has at least a basic knowledge base of the importance of accuracy, of documentation, of indicators. Get the right tools for the job. Again, the biggest issue that I had in my career is as things changed, we didn't have the, the space, the fields in our ERP to add additional information. So consider getting the right tools for the job. Consider a specialized third-party option or software or at least a, a company or a vendor that can assist you with your vendor master. In other words, hire the experts. It seems like it might be overkill, but all it would take is just one instance of there being a significant issue um, and fines, et cetera, financial uh, loss to the company could be severe. I'm not trying to scare you, but just a reality. Vendor master management options. Now, this is great. If you had access to a tool where it actually had a vendor portal, then the vendor could literally go in and self-serve. In other words, they could put all the information in during their, they're doing the onboarding. They're answering questions, filling in fields, um, whatever information is required, they are supplying so the accuracy is on their plate. whether it be the address, the, again, the payment method, and choices. Again, you might need to limit these to what your company offers, but that way, again, they know what's available, they're making the selections. More importantly, it would be automatically vetted against the um, office, I'm sorry, I forgot the acronym, let me look it up here. Um, the Office of the Foreign Asset Control and the, um, Let's see if I can find it here. SMD is the Specially Designated Nationals List. Again, because if you're working with a, a system um, that's a cloud-based system, SAS model, it would be something that the this information would be automatically vetted. All right. So we've talked about the vendor, we've talked about the vendor master, the importance of information. 
But let's go a little bit further than that. Again, with future-proofing accounts payable, let's talk about accounts payable workflow. First of all, the basic definition of workflow is a series of tasks performed in a set order to reach a predetermined outcome. So whether it's done manually or electronically, there still needs to be certain steps performed in a set order in order to successfully process invoices. You also need input from various sources, such as purchasing for the purchase order, the receiving department for the receipt information, even if it's being posted into um, your ERP. You also need, may need approval and account coding from other department managers throughout your company. And of course, these, depending on how many locations you have, um, this could be from multiple states, cities, maybe even countries. And of course, all of this processing, whether it's the vendor master, whether it's the processing of invoices, whether it's the pulling of the payment proposal and the actual payment, should be based on firm policies, procedures, business rules, and other best practices. Keep in mind that even within accounts payable operations, even if they're processing PO invoices, there may still be multiple workflows that might need to be followed because if you are doing um, inventory purchase order invoices versus service invoices, there may be a difference in how those invoices are processed, what information may, need, may be required, or maybe whether additional approvals are needed on one set of purchase orders or another. So some of the benefits of automation and this is for accounts payable invoices, is that once invoices are into the system or into the process, which might start from you scanning invoices into a um, supplier or provider, is that certain information can be captured from the invoices using OCR. This means your accounts payable members are not saying, oh, this is an invoice from ABC, therefore the invoice number is here, the purchase order number is here, and the date's over here but the next invoice might be from XYZ company and the information's in totally different fields. Through an OCR process, that information can be captured and can be presented to accounts payable in a standard format. The routing of invoices can be done within a single system. So whether it is a purchase order invoice exception or whether it's a non-PO invoice that needs to go out for coding and approval, it can all be done within one system. No more inter-office envelopes, emails, or scans. It's, more, it's easier to identify invoices that need to be accrued. How many of you at the end of the month are being asked to uh, set up an accrual and you have no idea where all the invoices are because you may not even be aware of some of the invoices that have been received by the company if they have not, in fact, been sent to accounts payable. A workflow system will also allow for the consistent application of rules, whether it is delegation of authority, tax rules, purchase price variances, et cetera. Cost controls within PO matching. So I just mentioned price variances. If your accounts payable department right now has a tolerance that if, there, if uh, an invoice is within 5% of the purchase order amount, in fact, the invoice is over, then the accounts payable department might be able to go ahead and process that, again, based on your company's rules. But do you want your team to stop every time an invoice comes through with a, with a variance to have to calculate whether it's 5% or not? Or, for that matter, how many accounts payable departments or people are taking it upon themselves to say it's close enough and processing it when in fact it's over the allowable tolerance. That's one example. Accounts payable automation systems will also supply dashboards so that you can see on one screen what the volume of invoices are that might need to be processed, what um, number might be past due, what, what amount is due, et cetera. They usually have very robust search tools 
So rather than trying to figure out which filing cabinet an invoice is in, you would be able to go to this automation tool and with a few clicks of the keyboard from your desk, be able to pull up invoices by an invoice number, a vendor, PO number, account code, et cetera. They would also have reports available. Just it looks like we're ready for our full first polling question. Great. Thanks so much, Anne. You'll see this question on your screen here. This first polling question says, do you know that tight controls in managing your vendor master can reduce delays and risks in processing and paying invoices? You'll see the answer options on your screen here. Not aware, never consider the connection between the vendor master and financial risks. We're aware, but interested to see if any risk factors are being missed by my company. Very aware, we are confident we have identified all potential risks and have addressed them in our procedures, or I don't know and would like to learn more. I'll give you a few moments here to go ahead and select your answer. For the reminder, you can scroll down until you see the submit button, to click on that and log your response. We'll just remind you as well, uh, we'll save some time towards the end of today's session to address questions with Ann and Rob, so please continue to submit your questions for them. And again, we'll try to save a few moments here. All right, this is our first poll of the day. Please go ahead and select your final answer here. And what we'll do now is go ahead and take a look at the responses. It looks like the most popular answer with about 43.4% is very aware. We are confident we have addressed, uh, excuse me, we are confident we have identified all potential risks and have addressed them in our procedures. And do you have any initial thoughts here about how our attendees have voted for the first poll? I'm actually very pleased to see such high percentages um, aware but interested to see if uh, any risk factors might be missed. Um, this is great. It's Again, my career spanned about 35 years, and um, 10 years ago, this I don't think this would have been the case. Maybe it's because of automation or just more awareness with uh, trade associations and that type of thing, but I'm very pleased to see it. Okay. Can I go ahead and move on, Jeff? Yep, absolutely. Thanks so much, Ann. Okay. So one of the biggest things with accounts payable, especially in a manual, manual shop, is the decision trees. Again, these can be automated. So for example, if you have, a vend if you have vendor master rules and regulations, again, how many things when entering or creating a new vendor are up to the discretion of the person uh, setting up the vendor in the system. For example, um, oh geez, they don't have um, a properly filled out 1099 or the 1099 has the information I need, but it hasn't been signed. Those types of things, um, again, if you're, if you're relying on a person to make the decision, not that they're making the wrong decisions, but they may be pressured or, or there may be expectations that they need to get the work done so some things may slip, okay? Again, with an automated system, it's pretty much black and white. Same with tax and other compliance rules applied, okay? If the invoice is supposed to be taxable and the vendor didn't add the tax, are there self-assessment tools that are available to take care of that or to highlight the issue? The assignment of account codes. In a manual shop, how often do you get an invoice back from a manager, a non-PO invoice, where they haven't put in the GL code or they didn't supply complete coding and it really may not be up to the AP person to again make that judgment call. Again, with automation, if a person doesn't put in the coding and they're supposed to, or if they put in coding and it's wrong, they will know it right then and there before they even forward that invoice or approve that invoice so it goes back to accounts payable. The same with other business rules, delegation of authority or the 4I rule. If you need two people to approve an invoice, then in automation, that can happen. The other thing about automation is that it stores the documents. It stores any comments that have been added. And it stores this information for the length of your retention period. And there's no additional real estate needed to store these files. The other thing is that in certain parts of the country, there's also the concerns of catastrophic disasters that can wipe buildings off the face of the earth. 
This way, the information is in the cloud. Not only do you have the documents, but you also have the audit trail, which includes a list of all the actions taken, who took those actions, the date, and any comments that the person may have added. And again, the access is limited by those that have been given author authorization to access the system and possibly by their user rights. <clears throat> Again, the dashboards is where you might be able to see volumes of invoices to be processed by invoice category, payment terms, payment methods, vendor types. Um, you might be able to, you would definitely be able to see the location of invoices. Are they out for approval? Are they in accounts payable? Have they been processed but they're awaiting payment? that type of thing. Okay. Again, the supplier portal, not only for them helping themselves to create their own vendor information, but also so that they can self-register and be able to submit invoices by email or access the system directly to see what the status of an invoice is. And there might be the, uh, the capability of a communications tool so that if an invoice can't be paid, or there's an issue with the invoice, the payment's been deferred, whatever, that information can be supplied to the vendor through the tool by sending them an email. Leveraging vendor details and automation. So we talked about vendor types, vendor categories, payment methods, et cetera. These could be leveraged in an automated system so that if you had special handling by vendor type, you could put those rules into the automated system. If you needed to identify invoices by payment terms, for example, you want to be able to make sure that the discount invoices are being processed as promptly as possible, so that's something, again, you could identify. If you need to make payment by wire transfer, then you could search by the payment method to see which invoices are ready to get paid. Auto application of details based on vendor. So for example, you might have a special rule, as I mentioned earlier, if it's a certain um, vendor, maybe your company isn't responsible for paying any freight charges, but an invoice comes in with freight charges on it, what do you do? Again, that would be a stopgap that automation could identify for you. Payment auto automation. Payments can tend to be kind of a pain to manage, especially if you have different payment methods, um, different payment types, not types, but um, discounts versus non-discounts, again, ACH versus check. So rather than having to worry about doing multiple payment, um, payment um, proposals, you would be able to keep everything the same. And again, with automation, it would apply the correct payment method um, into your ERP, pull the data. Again, um, look for any anomalies, et cetera. Pay globally, again, wire. Reduce risk and cost. Is there something that, um, if you have credit memos on the account and therefore no invoices have yet been paid, you'd be able to see what the credit memos are that are offsetting the invoices, but again, do not exceed the invoices for payment. There's also the ability of using PayPal or prepaid debit transactions. Okay. In other words, automation can offer infrastructure to a company that the company may not have. Okay. It can also address multiple currencies. So even if your, um, your, your invoices come in in multiple currencies and you want to be able to have that foreign exchange rate reported against the purchase orders, et cetera, automation can do that. Again, all payment methods within one run, approval requirements consistently applied. We talked about that before. You don't want to have anything slip. And again, a check or vetted against the uh, OFAC and SDN before each payment is made, just in the event that something changes between the time you have added a vendor who may have been vetted at one point, but something changed to that vendor before payment was actually made. 
And of course, you can also look into early payment options, such as, again, discounts, because invoices can be processed more promptly, supply chain financing, and again, other strategic uh, options, such as the, um, the credit cards. And again, the communication functionality. Once the payment is made, you can have email sent directly to your vendors. I know I'm getting a little tight on time here, Jeff, so I'll try to go through it quickly. 1099 and 1042 reporting, again, based on details from the vendor record within your automation tool, you would be able to pull these reports. IRS compliance for W-8 um, forms for overseas vendors, tax form data validation, such as, again, addresses, um, amounts, and especially with the $600 limit on 1099s, withholding calculations, and the prep, tax uh, form prep for the IRS. And again, also includes non-US entity tax ID collection. Think beyond today, and I want to highlight this. Think beyond today with the pandemic. What if your business changes? What changes have occurred since uh, February or March? Think about all of a sudden you have an influx of new suppliers because maybe you're acquiring another company. Maybe there's going to end up seeing more payments. You're looking into more of a global supplier base. Perhaps you're going into a multi-subsidiary uh, subsidiary, uh, GL structure, intercompany um, transactions, that type of thing. Again, FX conversions. Not only about acquisitions, but what if you are selling off a part of your business? Would you like to be able to transfer your open payables or your history to that company? Again, something to think about with automation. It would be easier to pull. Increased financial controls and fraud risk. Right. Again, with automation, the rules and regs can be applied systemically. All right, AP free. And then what else could change? So again, in this world of COVID-19, how many of you had your AP people having to stay home? Were they able to do accounts payable from home? Did they have to come into the office if they were working them from home to grab invoices to be able to process? And of course, the minute documents leave the building, there's the risk that they won't come back. Things to think about. So conclusion, find and use the right solution to build and maintain a strong foundation for accounts payable processing. Avoid paying amounts to an unsanctioned, unsanctioned business and delays in adding or editing vendor records. One thing I want to point out that people sometimes don't think about when it comes to accounts payable, the failure for accounts payable to pay invoices promptly and accurately can impact sales to customers. And the reason for that is that if you put on credit hold or your vendors are not supplying the goods or services, that may cause delays in deliveries to your customers. So that is something that is, should be considered. Again, ensure all details are accurate, even those upper and lowercase letters can make a difference, and that everything um, are correctly associated. So again, make sure you have the correct addresses to the correct vendors, um, phone numbers, bank information, that type of thing. Improve reporting by vendor master details, status of location of invoices, prepaid lists of invoices, payment reports, 1099, 1042 reporting. You can even with some automation tools pull up a paid on time report to let you know how many invoices or what percentage of your vendors are not being paid on time or are being paid on time or what discounts you may have missed. Consistency is key. Document the process. Make sure everyone's following it. If you do have policies and procedures and you're working on automation, make sure your provider knows what those rules and regs are. Limit ads and edit ability to only a select few when it comes to your vendor master. Again, accuracy is a must. Audit regularly. 
Don't let complacency settle in. Again, make sure the policies and procedures are being followed. And if complacency does come into play, take action. So with anything that you do, plan, do, check, and act. All right. Thank you very much to Jess and to Rob for inviting me to speak today, and I hope that you found benefit in this presentation. Jess, I think Excellent. I'm handing it back over to you for the polling question. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Anne, for a really great session, as always. Uh, before we transition to Rob's portion of today's presentation, we'll pause just briefly and launch our second poll of the day. This one says, how many supplier payments does your company make each month? You'll see the answer options on your screen here. Less than 100, 100 to 1,000, 1,001 to 5,000, or 5,000 plus. Just like our first poll, we'll give you a few moments to select your answer here. As a reminder for those attendees seeking credit for today, you'll need to answer three polling questions. This is the second question. Leave this question up for just a few more seconds. Once we close this question down, I think in the interest of time, I'll read out the most popular answer and then th hand things over to Rob. So please go ahead and make your final selection here. And what we'll do now is go ahead and take a minute to look at the results. It looks like the most popular answer here uh, with about 39% is 100 to 1,000 payments uh, each month. Well, without further ado, uh, again, want to say a huge thank you to Anne for teeing up uh, our topic today. Rob, it's now my pleasure to turn things over to you uh, to kick off your presentation. Welcome, Rob. Thank you very much, and thank you, Anne. That was a really great presentation. I was a I love your content. It's it's just right on top of all the trends and um, provides a lot of value to our audience. So so thank you. Um, and it's really good to see in the poll, by the way, um, how many companies are kind of thriving mid-market companies. So um, you know it's it's good to see that population out there. That's certainly the population that uh, that Topalti focuses in on. So that's really encouraging. Um, so I'll make this brief because I think the value the audience really gets is, you know, hearing from people like Anne and also uh, hearing interactive questions. But we wanted to give a, a perspective uh, of, of our view of the world and where we think finance is going um, in, in alignment, of course, with the topic of future proofing uh, global payable operations, which Anne just talked about so, so clearly. But, you know, what it really comes down to is a mentality of looking forward to the future and thinking about scalability, efficiency, controls, and of course, visibility uh, for your business, not just in the accounts payable department, but for your entire finance organization, uh, with accounts payable being, of course, a key component of that. So, you know, when we look at it, and when you read various uh, reports from McKinsey and uh, Boston Consulting and Harvard Business Review and CFO.com, uh, and many of the things that Ann actually just talked about, uh, you know, the finance team and the CFO, the controller, finance directors, and the entire organization is being held to a, a higher standard um, and being viewed as a key uh, enabler of, of business success. Uh, particularly with COVID-19, there's been multiple articles written about how much more important finance is being looked at as a department that helps the company navigate through the storm, so to speak, and make the best decisions to uh, help the company keep scaling, make sure that they have a sustainable business model, um, and, and really guide the strategic decision-making of the business using data, which, of course, finance is the best at of any department in the business. Those are things like adapting to business changes, globalization, mergers, acquisitions, of course, business visibility and decision-making, uh, fraud, of course, and some of the risk side uh, of the business. The problem is that Along the way, there's something called accounts payable, which is you know multiple surveys out there by multiple different finance associations and such uh, consistently say that accounts payable is noted as the single most time-consuming function in the finance operation. And the, the problem is if, if the finance operation, the finance organization continues to allow legacy manual accounts payable processes to continue, it'll continue being that way and essentially steal time, steal resources uh, from the CFO, from the controller, and from the entire finance team, where instead of helping the business make better decisions and partner with, the, with departments uh, to guide their decision-making, making sure costs are under control and decisions are being made right with actual you know, version of truth data, 
um, they have to focus on registering new suppliers and collecting and processing invoices and chasing down approvals and jumping into various bank portals to process payments. And then of course, reconciliation with uh, uh, which delays the financial close at the back end of the process. And Anne touched on all these processes you see on the page here, but this is just some further data showing how manual uh, this process is across every function, whether it's supplier onboarding, whether it's payment error rates and rejections and the, the costs of bank fees that go along with it whether it's not only making U.S. payments, but cross-border payments, or, or dealing with a multi-subsidiary structured organization, uh, whether it's communication of payment status uh, with the suppliers, which no one in finance really wants to deal with, and of course, that financial close, reconciliation, and then things like tax, which aren't typically thought of as part of AP, but absolutely are, um, particularly with the risks that, uh, that have come with the IRS uh, really kind of focusing in on the W-8 forms and 1042S. You know, so, so the view that we take is technology has a role here and essentially can be applied to those, those areas of finance which are, are critical to the function uh, and uh, which, which steal time from the finance team who can use that, their talent, for higher value purposes, such as the items listed at the top of this page, enabling rapid growth, improving productivity in the business, making operational improvements, improving visibility, uh, and other forms of dreaming bigger and enabling success for the company. So I'll touch briefly on policy before we go into questions. Um, you know, we recently took out a 150 million round of funding at a 2 billion plus uh, valuation, uh, have almost 300 million uh, of funding as a company. You can see many of our customers, we have thousands of them uh, across a range of different company sizes and industries. So you can see many uh, good examples here. Some smaller, some larger. Of course, this slide shows some of the, the, the more many unicorns, a few public companies, and some other fast-growing, well-known, respected brands. Uh, 12 billion in transactions flow through the system, and what we're most proud about is that our customer satisfaction retention rates. Um, it's frankly one of the reasons we got that valuation um, that we have, so uh, we're really proud of that, and it's a big part of our DNA at the company to really focus on customer success and um, and, and make sure that, uh, that we're delivering a good experience for our clients. The core benefits that, you know, a system like Topalti uh, deliver, I mean, the first piece is we focus on, on high-velocity uh, companies who are often growing, changing, maturing, and the such. And so the system is built from beginning to end as a system that will scale uh, with your finance organization, with your overall business, and that you won't have to rip and replace as you keep growing. Uh, scalability, of course, is one of the key benefits we deliver along with efficiency. We typically automate about 80% of the AP workload um, so that finance can focus on higher value initiatives. And in the future, as finance and the whole business uh, adds more headcount, they don't have to add more headcount in AP hiring as you keep growing. Financial controls uh, and helping prevent risk for the business is another key uh, tenant and benefit of our system. And of course, visibility. If you can accelerate your financial close by 25% with instant uh, payment reconciliation, as well as get real-time uh, insight into the spend across all geographies, all subsidiaries, all payment methods, that improves the business decision-making uh, on, on the spend side of the, the scale, of course. On the right-hand side, you can read these. I won't go through them in detail just from a time perspective, but there's a variety of things that make us stand out, um, but namely is number one. Uh, that we've looked at every chevron of the accounts payable process from beginning to end, from supplier onboarding to tax to global payments and multi-subsidiary AP, all the way down to financial close and payment reconciliation, and addressed every single one of those. And that's how we deliver upon that scalability and that 80% reduction in workload, along with reduction in risk and uh, better uh, financial close cycle times. And finally, I'm not going to... I'll, I'll flip over this, uh, it, you know, but essentially this kind of talks about our holistic approach uh, to the business. It's very much like a system like NetSuite approached the mid-market on the ERP side. Uh, we, you know, we've looked at every single process within finance, uh, within the accounts payable function, and really tried to automate it and modernize it as much as humanly possible. And that's kind of delivered that scalability and automation value to our clients. 
Here you can see uh, some of the value we delivered to our clients. We have a very close partnership with NetSuite, who's co-sponsoring today's webinar. Uh, NetSuite, as, as many of you on the phone will know, is the world's leading cloud ERP system and helps companies uh, get visibility across their entire organization, uh, really get strong, robust accounting procedures and processes on the GAAP accounting side. And so we've, uh, since both of us really do focus on that mid-market, and they are the leading uh, company in the space for sure, we've really focused on having a very deep integration uh, with, with NetSuite uh, in multiple places, at the supplier record, at the invoice record, at the payments effort rec record, as well as the payment status record. Uh, and then as well, NetSuite has NetSuite One World, which allows a multi-subsidiary company to operate across the world uh, and get overall global visibility while having controls and local visibility as well. And so we integrated the subsidiary general ledger uh, and that all those things combined with that rich integration is what really helps even accelerate that financial close. And you can read some of the quotes in the bottom left from Foursquare Finance, as well as Printer Logic in terms of what the, the combined value of those integrated solutions uh, really deliver. And without further ado, um, I tried to accelerate that and keep us on track for the Q&A section, but I'll pass it right back over to, uh, to uh, address some of your questions. Great, thanks so much, Rob. I've got a couple planned questions for you, and then uh, we'll get into some of these great attendee questions I'm seeing come in as well. So uh, just to kick things off and really outline some of the benefits of automation, you've done the same as well. Um, I'm just curious during this time if you've seen more companies embrace automation, especially with most organizations still working remotely. Uh, you know, we, we, we've seen, and it's part of the reason, you know, it's unusual we took out this funding during COVID-19, but what the market's seen in general uh, beyond policy is that the entire automation space has really accelerated because what, what essentially COVID-19 and the work from home uh, requirements have done is, is really isolated out certain process in the business that, that were not modern, that failed in that type of uh, structure. Um, and it made people realize that, that that actually may be a necessity every once in a while. And you've got to have these mod modern digital uh, processes in place uh, to scale with that. And as an example, there is checks, right? There's still a lot of finance people that uh, bizarrely hold on to checks, even though it's noted consistently as the number one most fraud uh, prone uh, payment method um, by a wide margin. Um, wire transfer is number two, and it's not even close in terms of the, the trend line. And so, uh, you know, that's a good example of a process that should have changed a while, but people were just kind of legacy and comfortable with the status quo. And But working from home with COVID has totally broken the whole check process. And it's not that you have to eliminate checks completely, but you should have it as a payment method, but probably incent people toward more digital methods, both for efficiency, for cost, for fraud prevention and such. Um, and with digital process, I know it's a policy of our clients, only about within the various, we, we, we support six payment methods right now, about 5% of their total payments are made via check uh, these days uh, with the policy versus the norm, if you read analyst reports, is somewhere between 70 and 80% of payments in the US are still being made by check, which is a astounding number. Um, and so that's a good example of, uh, of a process that within AP, the overall AP process for sure um, has been kind of, uh, automation has kind of taken a higher ground with COVID has really isolated the problems with, with old school processes, but that's a good example with checks of, of one such process within AP that needs modernization. That's great. No, thanks so much, Rob. I was gonna ask you a question about that. I guess, you know, if we're, we're looking ahead here, we know that AP is notorious for being the most manual back office process. Um, in your experience, are there certain warning signs that organizations or customers uh, come to you with that makes them realize and makes you realize it's, it's really time to help streamline some of their approaches to invoice management? Yeah, for sure, and it's a really good question. Um, typically what we see is as companies bypass 100 payments a month, uh, 100 invoices, 100 payments a month, around that time the pain uh, and the time consumption that's related to managing the accounts fun uh, payable function starts really rapidly increasing. Uh, the business needs to start thinking, should I hire more AP people? Uh, the business starts getting more complexity 
Um, usually that also correlates with a mature company. And so when you're bypassing 100 and reaching 200, 300 payments a month, uh, your company's maturing. Uh, in the early days of a company when you're like, let's say 30 employees, you're not really thinking risk. But as you get bigger and you have a more mature business, you do have to think about things like fraud, audits, uh, tax compliance, regulatory compliance, how to put controls in place for a scalable organization that eliminates the risks that are, are related to those four things I mentioned earlier. And so things like risks start showing up. Oftentimes when you're becoming a mature finance org, you're also starting to think about opening up multiple different geographies, either as a cost center or as a demand center. And that means a multi-subsidiary structured organization. Um, and so they start thinking about that. You often will have more global suppliers. Uh, global suppliers are much more difficult to pay. They still have demands in terms of payment methods they prefer and ones they won't accept. And that changes some process within the accounts payable uh, space. Uh, and it also often leads, both as you increase suppliers, increase invoices, as well as go global, it increases to accelerating payment error rates. Typically, payment error rates average around 3%, um, and that escalates essentially as you have cross-border payments and multi-entity accounts payable functions. Uh, so those are just a few of those issues. Of course, as you grow, you know, visibility to the business, financial close, uh, tight financial close cycle times are also important. And so those are a few types of trends or patterns that, that we've seen in terms of when a company should really start thinking about upgrading and automating their accounts payable processes. Excellent. Yeah, thanks for walking us through those, Rob. Uh, much appreciated. And I guess, you know, you and Ann have, have really outlined the benefits of automating. It seems seems pretty obvious, but what advice would you have for some of our attendees who are on the line who are worried about getting buy-in um, to, to modernize from their CFO or maybe some of their higher-ups? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd actually, I think Ann would have some interesting observations here as well, but, you know, from my perspective, I think you should align with their strategic business goals. And so, you know, one strategic business goal that the CEO, the COO, the board, the VCs, the CFO are all going to get uh, for sure is visibility to the business. Uh, not only from a spend perspective, that's great, that is very important, but the finance function is more than a cost-cutting machine. And so spend visibility is great, but visibility into business performance as fast as possible is very important. Uh, you purchase systems like NetSuite uh, to do things like that, and a system like policy then adds on top of the payback from uh, an ERP and usually accelerates that, that visibility into the business performance by about 25% with that uh, instant reconciliation uh, with the ERP, which accelerates that financial close. So I think business visibility is one piece to, to hit on. The other piece to hit on is, you know, where does the, the executive team, the CFO, want to invest money in things that help you differentiate, innovate, grow, scale, improve productivity, and the such. And, and by automating the accounts payable function, future headcounts, uh, in finance, which can partner with the business and in other roles in the business, whether it's R&D, sales, marketing, alliances, um, product managers, et cetera, it can go to those resources and to, instead of uh, going to that, that AP part of the department. And so uh, that's another message I think uh, missed on often. And then finally, I would say the risk side. Um, you know, people really underestimate the value of the risk. It has improved over time. I think the answer earlier in the question about you know, how many people are noting the importance of having a proper vendor master record system in place um, and following some of those processes to eliminate payment errors and fraud and, and pro, you know, downstream issues in finance. Um, that's great progress, but I think a lot of um, business executives don't connect the dots between a, a tight, modern accounts payable process and the risk side of the business. Um, and how much uh, risk exposure is if, if that process is not uh, digitized and modernized. Excellent. Thanks, Rob. And I've got one more question for you, but um, while I ask that, I think I'm going to go ahead and just bring up our third poll that we can discuss um, after I ask you this question. And I just want to bring it back full circle to the title of today's webinar. You know, when we say future-proofing AP, what does that really mean to, to you, especially now, I guess? Is that a question for me, sorry? Yes. When you know, to bring it back to the title of the webinar, what do you what do you you know, what do we really mean when we say future proofing AP? 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it comes back down to, you know, what are the priorities of the business? What are the priorities of the, of the, of the finance team to enable the business and support the business's uh, goals? And, you know, if you put a pro- in place a process today that helps your business scale, your finance team scale, and your accounts payable team scale uh, with changes in your business, anticipating what future changes may happen in your business, but putting your system that has the various capabilities uh, and flexibility and agility, so as your business adapts, you can adapt with it very, very, very rapidly, and it doesn't slow down the rest of the business. That's really what we're saying at the end of the day. You know, you may have this many suppliers today or this many invoices or this many payments today, but what will it be tomorrow? You may have a single subsidiary structured business today, but will you add geos in the future? You may have suppliers only in the U.S. today, but what will you need in the future? Or maybe their payment preferences or demand for local currency payments will change. You may not worry too much about fraud, but what will your finance team look like in the future and where will they be located? Where will they be working? And do you have process in place that will scale with you uh, over the course of time? So it's really looking at a cross finance and across the business, anticipating those needs and then putting an AP system in place today that will support that, those future changes. And that can – everyone's going to have surprise at what the future will look like. And so can you, can you adapt to those changes as those needs arise? Excellent. I think that's a really nice note to to end on there and and bring it back all together. Um, We do have a couple questions. I think maybe, Rob, we can get to at least one of these. It's it's kind of a nice way to end since it it asked about our other co-sponsor for today. So we had an attendee ask, um, does your system only integrate with NetSuite? Uh, It does not. Um, I will say, you know, the the NetSuite integration is, you know, one suite app of the year uh, recently, and so it's a particularly robust we do integrate with Intact as well, as well as QuickBooks Online, um, and, and can integrate with other systems as well. So uh, we do integrate with other systems for sure. Excellent. That's great. No, thanks so much for, for answering that question. We've had a few more come in. Um, we're at the top of the hour, so I'm not going to ask them live, but what I'll do is share them with Rob and his team so they can follow up post-event, and we'll get you some answers uh, to those questions there. I want to say a huge thank you again to Rob and Anne for taking some time out to touch base on this important topic for all of us today. We've had a few folks ask, so friendly reminder, PDF of the slides can be found under the resource list. If you'd like an introduction to Anne, Rob, or from NetSuite, or to Palti, please do tell us in the survey you'll see on your screen here in just a moment. And finally, I want to say a big thank you again to our partners for today, NetSuite and to Palti, for making today's webinar possible. We always enjoy having them join us. Thanks again, Ann and Rob, and we hope that you all enjoy the rest of your day.